Hello, Environmental Policy One students. Uh, Dr. Conway here for Lesson 7 on International Environmental Agreements. Um, we go into uh, International Environmental Agreements in greater detail on Environmental Policy One, but in terms of our course narrative, the way we've been doing it, looking at the uh, the structural, ideational, uh, and process uh, uh, circumstances that environmental policy needs to operate through. Uh, we need to take a quick look at international environmental agreements now. You will recall that we've had previous lessons on on the uh, constitutional division of powers, the uh, the dynamic of federalism and the, the role that plays on impacting environmental policy on the uh, interdepartmental and interagency relationships in the federal government and how that impacts on, on uh, environmental policy, on how um, science can impact environmental policy, how the different geophysical properties of the environment across the country can impact environmental policy, and how different economic circumstances based on those geophysical properties of, of various regions of the country will impact on, on environmental priorities and how those environmental priorities play out in terms of our own policy. Uh, we've also discussed those issues. So, but now we're taking it to that other dynamic of, of environmental policy context, which is the international context. And uh, obviously for a country like Canada that is, is, is such a highly open economy in terms of global trade and so on, uh, the relationship of, of our environmental policy to international dynamics is particularly critical. And this for a number of reasons. Not only the economic integration of the Canadian economy into the broad, broader global economy, but also the, um, the, the fact that many of the most recent environmental problems that we have and we face, we can't face alone. Things like climate change, transboundary movement of toxic chemicals, invasive species, uh, you know, global biodiversity loss, uh, all of these kinds of issues would be impossible for Canada to address alone in any case, right? So, um, because the scale of the issues is just beyond Canada's legal and otherwise uh, capacities to, to respond to the problems. So, uh, clearly, uh, the international dynamic is a very important one. So, let's pay, take up these issues now. And, uh, and then, in, in, like I say, we're touching on it this, this term, but next term in Environmental Policy 2, we get into uh, international agreement dynamics a bit more. Okay, so, I mean, <clears throat> you know, we went through the discussion in one of our earlier lessons of how environmental problems have, have, have become more complex over time, you know, moving from local issues of a relatively contained basis like local air pollution problems, local water contamination problems, uh, you know, local waste disposal related problems to becoming more and more, then moving into regional issues and then regional issues that also included a, a another neighbor country like in the United States, Great Lake Water Quality Agreements and so on and then from regional issues to kind of more national scale issues and now to global issues. And we've talked about how this has all occurred and, and as we've moved from, from local issues to, to regional issues, the international dynamics of environmental policy became more and more a reality of how you have to operate when you're de devising environmental policy, right? So that moving from local to regional to national to bilateral to multilateral, in terms of the, the, the scale of problems has, has basically introduced new complexities into devising environmental policy measures, right? Um, and, we, and we've seen this occur at the same time that we've seen science become more, more capable of identifying problems as well, right? So we've had this changing dynamic of problems, but we've also had the changing complexity of problems that is going on, right? And at the same time you're trying to respond to all of this change, you have those those institutional, structural, ideational, and process issues that shape, um, you know, the degrees of freedom we have in moving towards environmental policy solutions. And in the global problems, transaction costs are just that much higher, right? Now you're not only dealing with complexity of division of diffusion of power and so on at the national level, 
but you're now dealing with that at the global level. So you can, in that, when you see it in that context, in the lessons we've had so far, you now have the tools to be able to understand or to begin to understand how this complexity becomes magnified, right? Um, and we've seen problems become more diffuse as well, right? Environmental problems. You know, earlier problems would have been, you know, we saw the sources as highly concentrated. You know, a pulp and paper mill that was spewing too much sulfur or one plant or two plants in a small town that were letting too much industrial byproduct run off into the river to a situation now where we have global problems that have diffuse and dispersed causes, right? I mean, when you're talking about climate change, we don't have one plant or two plants causing a problem. We have millions of plants causing a problem. We have millions of oil and gas users causing a problem. We have millions of people driving automobiles. We have, you understand, so the complexity in, uh, of the problem becomes one of also greater diffusion of the sources of the problem and therefore more points of, more points of the causes of the problem that have to be influenced, right? And so the complexity becomes compounded. And at the same time that we've we've seen this evolution of environmental problems uh, through through time, we've also seen a change in emphasis. Right? We've we now realize that if we're going to stay on top of all of these problems, we have to move from a from a mindset of of end of pipe mitigation of environmental problems to one of pollution prevention. Right? Trying to <clears throat> prevent the problem from continuing to grow or prevent the problem from continuing to worsen rather than sort of thinking that we can mitigate it at the end of the pipe or fix it after the fact. Which, you know, lay, you know, basically now we have a predominant paradigm in our field where prevention is always better than mitigation. And that can be validated in numerous areas. Okay? So, um, but this is all, the, all this change has, has, has been mirrored or reflected onto the international negotiations. As problems went from local to regional, to national, to to bilateral, to multilateral, uh, the international regime has been catching up with this, right? As early as 1972, right? Um, you know, Canada basically got involved in, you know, the Great Lakes water quality, acid rain, migratory birds, environmental impact assessment for cross-border issues, etc. Because we had to, because the problems were, 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 were changing in nature. We could no longer treat them as if they were local or regional national issues, okay? They were bigger than that, okay? So as early as 1972, this was already being picked up by the international community in the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm, Sweden, which is a famous sort of international convention which really began to kick off the, the whole international environmental management regime between countries, all right? Several international environmental agreements predate the Stockholm Conference, but this major international conference triggered a flurry of activity, all right? Countries and international organizations responded to the emerging challenges of environmental problems that could not be addressed by any one, one country or small group of countries, all right? So now the international community had to become mobilized. And as soon as that happens, of course, if you're a national regulator in the area of the environment, you can no longer just consider the national circumstances, particularly when your, your environmental policy challenges are of a geophysical uh, and economic nature that they're no longer localized. They're, they're now international, uh, at least bilateral, if not multilateral, with a few countries or many countries, like climate change, all countries, right? Um, and so, and then UNEP had to come along, right? The United Nations Environment Program uh, out of the Stockholm Convention. And, and UNEP is headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. <clears throat> Worked with them there many times. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, a strange setup because that got set up in a developing country and for good reason. We need to, to move more of the environmental activities to other countries in the world. And, and uh, you know, yet it, it has remained a, uh, a program uh, rather than being a full uh, agency like the, or, or organization of the UN. So to a degree, the environment is still to this day marginalized within the UN system. It's, a, it's a more of a junior program as opposed to a, a full organization. It's like the contrast between UNEP and the World Health Organization, okay, or the International Monetary Fund or the agricultural organization. Or, or whatever, right? So uh, Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, which is located in Rome. 
So, um, you know, this is, this is just the reality. So we are still, to this day, we are still trying to have the international regime come to grips with this changing nature of environmental problems as they've, and it doesn't mean that the local problems aren't still there. They're still there. But the point is, is we've now layered on regionally and bilateral and multilateral because the nature of the problems themselves has been, is transforming constantly. And of course, you know that, that, that institutions, structures, ideas, and processes of, of environmental policy, you know, take time to catch up to this, this transformation of, of the nature of environmental problems as population growth continues to go up, as, as industrialization continues to exploit the environment at faster and faster rates, as pollution continues to occur, even though a larger percentage of industry is much cleaner today than it was even 10 years ago, much, much cleaner. But still, the scale of the issues you know, I mean, you have you have that scale continuing to expand and uh, the problems will obviously continue to accrue and more and more challenges are posed to the global community as we're seeing in climate change, as we're seeing in biodiversity with the continued burn off of the, the Amazon jungle with all of the issues that we're facing. All right. Endangered species is a huge global problem. OK. So UNEP has tried to become a central coordinating arm for a significant number of international agreements, and it is. The Basel Convention, Stockholm Convention, so on, right, uh, are all under the auspices of UNEP. But the, the ability to keep up with these, these global trends is an extremely challenging situation. And then by 1987, when we saw that there was, a, you know, there was still huge gaps in, in global understanding and global institutional capacity at the local, national, and international levels, you know, we had the, uh, you know, uh, the United, Station, United Nations established the World Commission on Environment Development, our common future in 1987, you know, the result known as the Brundtlin Report, right? And sustainable development became the basis for a major review of all international environmental activities in the United Nations through the United Nations Conference on Environment Development, UNSED, held in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I remember drafting a, a position paper for Environment Canada for attending the 1992 uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, conference, okay? And, uh, you know, that was a long time ago now. I was just a junior environment uh, person working with a small firm at that time uh, while still teaching at the University of Ottawa. And, you know, the difference between then and today is marked. A lot more activity internationally, but still, uh, you know, the problems are continue to mount, right? We know that we're not keeping pace with by global biodiversity loss, global species loss. Uh, chemical contamination, plastics in the ocean, uh, greenhouse gases, and so on. So the challenges are still there, and the systems, right? The ideas, the the structures, and the processes, uh, and institutions of of international environmental governance are are still far too weak for us to move ahead as aggressively as we need to on this. Um, and so th there's a major a need for this kind of action. Okay. And then, you know, Ung said, uh, articulated an ambitious program out, out of Brooklyn, right, uh, uh, on sustainable development contained in the famous document called Agenda 21, right, and everybody should, should know about Agenda 21. The Rio Conference helped establish the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development, which is now defunct, and reaffirmed the role of the Global Environment Facility. Uh, and uh, I, I advised the G Jeff on, on chemical-related uh, work for a number of years. Um, uh, so these are the types of activities that have gone on, all right? Uh, Ung said was also key to uh, the original framework conventions on climate change and bio biological diversity came out of Ung said, all right? Uh, the discussions at Aung said also carried forward deliberations on multilateral environmental agreements that were already in place, such as the Basel Convention, uh, right, on, on transboundary movement of hazardous waste from 1984. All right. So all of this has been going on to try to catch up with the fact that the new reality is that a lot of our major environmental problems today are global. There's no way for any one single country to address these problems. It's impossible. So it has to be addressed through multilateral mechanisms, right? 
Uh, so there's now a complex web of institutions and organizations, what we call regimes, that have developed around international environmental cooperation generally and MEAs more specifically, multilateral environmental agreements. These, are, the, these institutions differ from one from another to reflect di different legal characteristics of the environmental or public health problems they are addressing, like Montreal Protocol is opposed to Basel, Basel is opposed to Stockholm Convention, and so on, all right? Uh, one of the major defining characteristics of international institutions and their activities involves around their role in international hard law as opposed to soft law. Now, hard law agreements are known as legally binding on states that ratify the agreement. In other words, Canada's officials get together, we decide on our position, we go out and negotiate agreement and we sign on to it. Does that make it hard law? Well, yes, it makes it hard law from the point of view in those types of agreements, countries are supposed to bring it back home and get the, the agreement ratified in Parliament and, and approve appropriate regulations to implement the provisions of the agreement. Okay, and those are hard law agreements. Those would be like the Montreal Protocol, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, uh, the Biological Diversity Convention, the Desertification Convention, and these kinds of things, right? These are supposed to be hard law agreements that countries, negotiating teams, when they sign off, they come back and they uh, get it ratified in their own national legislatures, okay? Uh, soft law agreements are, are more things like the uh, Strategic Approach to International Chemicals Management, SICAM, which is which are guidance and, and, and voluntary or aspirational agreements. They're agreements, but they're aspirational agreements, which we call soft law, as opposed to being a hard law agreement that gets ratified when you bring it home uh, in your own national uh, decision-making processes. Uh, so, you know, these are, these are fundamental differences, and I'm not going to get into them a great deal now. We will talk about them more in environmental policy, too. All right, but all international agreements and MEAs, hard and soft law, draw on customary international law and a range of practices and principles that have become widely accepted. In other words, there is international law, right? And these conform with international law. Again, a level of detail that, that uh, uh, you know, given everything else we've got going on in the course, we won't go into a great deal of detail on that now. Um, okay, so, but principles and practices that are incorporated in most of these international environmental agreements are what we call MEAs, multilateral environmental agreements, are the same kinds of ones we see in national law, principles you've already explored with respect to national legislation. Prevention is in there, right? Um, is, so we know why, right? It's, it can be difficult or almost impossible to repair environmental dam damage once it has occurred. So it is better to avoid such damage in the first place. It's a very logical proposition. Another one you often see in these agreements is the concept of su subsidiarity. I mean, even though we agree to what our objectives are internationally, how those, delivered, uh, those, those things are delivered are delivered locally. So in other words, you, you know, every country is not going to conform to the same way to delivering on their international agreements, right? They all have unique institutions, unique processes, unique ideas, unique structures of their own jurisdictions, and so they will implement the agreements in the way they see, they say uh, is most suitable to their circumstances. Uh, but there is a principle of subsidiarity that calls for decision-making and responsibility to fall to the lowest level of government or political organization that can effectively take action. And I think you can see why subsidiarity is a big thing in international environmental agreements, because reaching international agreements is always a balancing act with national sovereignty, right? Again, a big set of issues that we won't go into in a great deal of detail uh, just quite yet. Okay, um, and then another big one that's unique to international is common and differentiated responsibilities. Okay, that, that you'll see that in virtually every environmental agreement, much the same way you'll see subsidiarity and for much the same reasons. Okay, many environmental regimes will require the participation of numerous countries, both rich and poor, right? But countries have different resources at their disposal. 
So while the parties to environmental regimes all acknowledge common responsibility for the environment, they also work to develop differentiated responsibilities for addressing environmental problems. And that's why most MEAs will usually have some kind of a financial mechanism attached to them where resources flow from rich countries to poor or to least developed countries or, or developing countries, LDCs or, or DCs, to, uh, to help them come into compliance with the International Environmental Agreements or Multilateral Environmental Agreements, MEAs. And, and people say, well, why would developed countries do that? Well, because most because the the, the sources of the problems are, are not you know are not controllable by just developed countries, right? It's, this is a global issue. There are global sources of the problem, and the impacts of the problem disproportionately impact poorer countries. Climate change is a classic example. So we have a we have a practical reason for funding developing countries. We have a self interested reason for funding developing countries, but we also have a more moral and ethical obligation for helping developing countries because most of the greenhouse gas loading into the atmosphere that has occurred over the last hundred years has been through countries that, that industrialized soonest. And who are those countries? The developed countries. All right. So openness is another thing you'll see, has, and this is very much the transparency language you'll find in Canadian legislation. But transparency and public participation means it's, it's critical at the international level because to ensure national buy-in, uh, you know, you have to engage people. I mean, people, countries have to come, the smallest countries in the world have to come to table with the biggest countries and everybody has a vote. Otherwise, you're going to get people walking away from the table, right? So open, openness, transparency, fairness. In procedural sense, fairness. We we all know that that in the final analysis, money talks, but you know, and and other forms of power talk, but at least in the process of international negotiations, that openness, transparency, and equality uh, of representation means a lot. Okay, because you can see that you know a classic example of where the politics would get out of hand on this is. Green, greenhouse gases and climate change. Okay, you have the United States pulling out of the Paris Agreement because they don't want to pay, they don't want to do, they don't want to. And the developing countries saying, look, we can't do anything about it if we don't get any help, which is also true. So you've got these dynamics and you try to overcome these dynamics by engaging all, all countries around the table as equals, even though we know that politically and economically they're, they're not, right? Um, but that's the way it goes. And then you have the polluter pays principle, which is, uh, you know, uh, also occurs in national legislation as in international. But of course, in that context, it takes on a slightly different form, right? Polluter pays becomes uh, common but differentiated responsibilities type language, saying developing countries should pay a bit more. Our developed countries should pay a bit more and help developing countries. All right. And the precautionary approach, we all know about that. Precautionary approach is in UNCSAID, in, in all of the major international agreements somewhere, all right? That precaution should be taken, right? But it's even more difficult to implement precaution at the international level than it is the national level, of which I've talked to you about before, okay? And then we also have to recognize that there are limits of MEAs in, in practice, okay? Um, you know, if international legal obligations were the criterion for success at international environmental management, we would be on a steady course for a more sustainable global future, right? But the reality is that a number of countries that have not fully complied with MEA obligations, and they talk about money, resources, capacity, other priorities, we have people to feed, we have, you know, all, you know, uh, at least in part, completely legitimate rationales. But we also know that a lot of other politics of self-interest and powerful groups in one country deciding not to spend the money on that and so on, right? Uh, it enters into it substantially, all right? For example, as early as 1994, an IUCN study of CITES implementation showed that the, of the 81 countries examined, only 15 had legislation in place to completely fulfill their obligations. And 27 countries met none of the requirements, okay? Uh, Convention on International Trade in, uh, in, in Endangered Species is what CITES stands for, all right? Uh, and, and that would be true of many agreements, some less than others. Montreal Protocol, 
not so much. Stockholm Convention is also improving, but you know the Basel Convention, there are problems there, you know because you know we we are dealing with, you know many 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 dozens, you know uh, hundred or more countries in some of these agreements, right? And we're trying to get them to be uh, fully implemented. Uh, you know so. We've also seen a slowdown in establishing new multilateral environmental agreements because the current ones, you know, not being fully implemented. The, the, the priority of the international community has shifted to implementing what we've already got more fully as opposed to layering on more and more uh, obligations that countries have proven, that a lot of countries have proven they can't fulfill the ones we've already got. So this, this, this creates a significant problem for uh, global environmental policy, right? We, we came to call this, when negotiating SACEM in particular, uh, of which I was involved quite heavily, we, we, that's the strategic approach to international chemicals management, the concept of the implementation gap became very prominent, okay? Uh, and, and that's the, the gap between aspirations and contained in hard law and soft law and what actually happens on the ground, right? And we became to call it the implementation gap, okay? And, and that implementation gap, during SACAM, we looked at various agreements that dealt with chemicals and, and we identified various areas where the implementation gap was significant. And again, I'm not going to go into a great detail on, on this, right? But let's suffice it to say that developing countries are a special case for two reasons, right? First, while all countries have limited resources, developing countries' limitations are far more restrictive. Let's say a country like Canada or Sweden or Norway wealthy countries, right? Second, developing countries have a right to expect help from the North in meeting their obligations. And I think that's generally agreed. I mean, when we're dealing with a lot of problems, for example, chemicals, where did, where did most of the innovation in chemicals originate? Well, it originated in developed countries, right? Where did industrialization and, and greenhouse gas spewing industry first emerge? Well, it emerged in developed countries, right? Um, so, there's been a, a bargain, right, whereby the rich would help the poor meet tough standards of environmental protection. And to a substantial extent, that has occurred in some areas. I mean, billions and billions and billions of dollars have been transferred from developed to developing countries to come to grips with environmental problems. But billions and billions of dollars is a lot of money, but the scale of the environmental problems is much bigger still, all right? Um, so we, we now this is this is a major cause of what we call the implementation gap, right? Just the limited capacities of, of many developing countries and certainly the LDCs, the least developed countries, to come to grips with these global environmental problems, right? So, you know, a lot of our problems are, are you know, as they move from local and regional within a country's boundaries and they can be addressed. But as they move to bilateral they become more complicated, right? We've seen this with the Great Lakes where we've had periods of time with great cooperation with the United States on Great Lakes cleanup and so on. But in the recent period, trying to get the United States to do anything on bilateral environmental problems, you know, is to say the least uh, uh, difficult, all right? And then when you move to multilateral environmental agreements and multilateral environmental problems like transboundary movement of persistent organic pollutants under the Stockholm Convention, uh, you know, recent agreements on greenhouse gases and stuff like that, the problems become much more difficult because you're dealing with more countries, more uh, diffuse, uh, you know, sources of the problem, uh, more complexity in terms of cultural, social, and economic capacities of countries to act. Uh, you know, the, the complexity becomes that much more severe, right? So um, this is a constant challenge, right, in terms of this narrative we've been following in our course about the context within which environmental policy much op must operate. All right. On that score, I'll let you go, and we'll be talking to you next time. Take care, gang. Bye-bye now.